Kathy is going to lead us in that chorus a couple more times. Would you stand with me this morning before I give you some announcements? Let's sing it together. Prepare our hearts for the worship this morning and give him thanks for who he is and what he's done for us. Lead us. Kathy, will you do that? Well, I've got so much to thank him for, so much.
to say this out loud, but uh, just think about it for a moment. Where were you in 1980? Can you remember where you were? Maybe some of you are getting so old you can't remember where you were in 1980. 1980. Think back for a moment. 1980. Some of you want to shout out where you were, right? <laughs> in a delivery room, were you? <laughs> Uh, too much information there, Derek. No. <laughs> In the delivery room, your wife was about to give birth to Phil. All right. I didn't think it was your mom about to give birth to you. <laughs> that was somewhere in the 50s, wasn't it? <laughs> well, 1980, I was in grade 10. I was 20 years of age. No. <laughs> I was in grade 10. 
And at that point in my life, like a lot of us in high school, I was wondering what I was going to do after graduating from high school. Now, I knew deep down in my heart what I was supposed to do. I knew that from a real young age, that this is what I was called to do. But when I was in grade 9 and 10, I wasn't really thinking about being a preacher or a pastor. And I was thinking, what am I going to do? You know, the crunch is on. You say, well, pastor, you had a couple years. No, we didn't because we were the last grade 11 uh, graduating class. 1983, 1982 rather. The last grade 11, 11, after that was grade 12. You see, we were the smartest ones in the province. They had to come up with another grade for the rest of you. But I was in grade 10 and I was thinking about what I would do when I would graduate a little over a year later, grade 11. My dream was to be a person in uniform. When I was in grade three, we had a career day, and you couldn't get pictures off the internet back then. That came a few years later. But somehow I found a magazine, and I I saw an RCMP officer dressed in his red serge. And that always wows me, even today. Nothing looks any better than an officer in their red, I think that's what you call the red serge. And I cut that out of a magazine, I taped it to my desk, because I was going to be an RCMP officer when I grew up. Either way, I wanted to be in uniform. Then I started thinking about the armed forces, and that's where I was about to land. That's what I thought. In 1980, the Canadian forces really ramped up their efforts to recruit young men and women to sign up. And one of the ways they did that was through television commercials that tried to portray how exciting it would be for, to be a soldier. And uh, we only had two channels in Robert's Arm at the time, CBC and CTV. But that commercial was on every day. And I still remember one commercial in particular, and it got my attention, and I began the process of applying for the armed forces. I had the application filled out until one day, I won't get into too much detail on this, but... No, I really got to do what God wants me to do. And I came into the room and I, I showed my mother, I don't know if she remembered it, but I said, the application for the military has gone in the, in the garbage and this is an application for Bible school and the rest is history. So I never did get a chance to wear that uniform. But the armed forces, they really ramped up their commercial. And, and um, this week I thought about one commercial in particular and I actually found it on YouTube. And I wanted to use it this morning, about 38 seconds long, but Pastor Andy said, if you use it, there's a possibility we're going to infringe on some copyright, and they're going to bump us off face, t- face live stream, and couldn't, didn't want to do that this morning, but I remember the commercial, and in it we see, and I saw it again this week, and, and you see the Navy ships just cutting their way through the ocean, the jets and the helicopters flying above, and Everybody is having a great time. There's military exercises taking place, and, and the personnel are fully engaged, and then they see some social aspects of military life, and they really did a really good job. It's a grainy commercial. It's obviously not digital at that time, but what stood out to me was this. I'm going to try to do it. You can laugh. There's no life like it. <laughs> Remember the commercial? There's no life like it. There's no life like it. No, there's no life like it. And they would do that two or three times. And as a 15-year-old kid who wanted to be in the military, I'm thinking, man, that's the life. There's no life like it. Now, you might say I'm weird, but this week when I was thinking about this message, that commercial came to my mind. There's no life like it. No, there's no life like it. Well, I'm not here this morning to recruit anybody for the Canadian forces or to determine whether or not that commercial is fully true. You'd have to speak to military personnel and get a better take on it than that. But that title, There's No Life Like It, was birthed in my heart this week. Recently, I heard a sermon preached on a familiar subject and a a little piece of that sermon is going around Facebook and has become 
real popular. But the preacher, when he stood in the pulpit to preach the sermon and was about to cross, he said, I'm not here to tell you something that you don't already know, but to remind you of something that you must never forget. I tell you, that, that statement still goes over in my mind. And I used it recently preaching in a different context other than this one here. I'm not here to remind us or tell us something that we don't know. Because everything I'm going to say this morning more than likely is familiar to all of us here today, certainly most of us. But I'm here to remind us of something that we really can't afford to forget. And it's a simple truth of the gospel. And this morning I want to remind us of this truth, that there's new life found in and provided by Jesus Christ. Amen? And some of the songs we sang this morning, and Kathy was in this week, and, and she asked me where I was going with the preaching, and that was earlier the week, and I, I wasn't sure, and I couldn't tell her exactly, but she certainly connected to it this morning with the songs that referred to life. There's new life provided by Jesus Christ. There's new life found in him. And let me say it again this morning, there's no life like it. Can you repeat that after me at the count of three? One, two, three. There's no life like it. And that life of Christ, the life that we have in Jesus, it changes everything this morning. It changes everything about us, our values, our outlook, our perspective, the way we live, the way we think, the way we talk. It changes everything about us. But I want to settle on that that idea that there's new life in Christ. And maybe in another message we'll talk about how it changes us when it comes to how we live now. And there's one text this morning that we are all familiar with. Jesus is speaking here. He says, the thief comes to steal and kill and to destroy. Now, there's some argument in the commentaries as to who Jesus is referring to here when he talks about a thief. There are those who would say that he's talking about the false teachers who would make their way into the, 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 the church or the body of Christ and, and mess with our thinking and so on, and there's some truth to that. But this traditional view of this scripture is that Jesus was talking about Satan here. And Peter said himself that there is a real devil and he goes about seeking whom he may devour. So this makes sense to me, that Satan comes to steal, and only to do that. There's no good that comes out of him. He comes to steal and kill and to destroy. And folks, this morning, every, every week, throughout the week, I see and you see the effects of what the enemy is doing, and I'm not here to give him any glory But we have to admit this morning that in certain, in some people's lives, he is stealing, he's destroying, and he's killing. And yes, some even physically. He's destroying their souls. Sin destroys. The wages of sin is death, amen? Drugs and alcohol and so on. I see it. I've seen it recently what it can do, what it does, and what it's done to so many people, and they're left broken, they're left desperate. But Jesus says this, and that conjunction there, but, he says, I have come that they might have life, uh, and that they might have it to the full. Say amen to that this morning. As I began thinking about and preparing this message, this week about new life found in Christ. I, I started out this week, earlier the week, in my mind at least, in a totally different way than I've gone this morning. In fact, I went home on Friday and I had done some 
reading and some research as I would usually do and some study from commentaries and so on. When I go home Friday, I'm never fully ready for Sunday. It doesn't work that way with me. I'm a five o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning kind of guy or six o'clock and I get up, I have it in my head what I want to write and I sit to my my desk at the, mo- at the time would be my dining room table. Nobody is around. Our little dog is not even awake. And I sit to the table, and as I sat there yesterday morning, I began to write, and I began to type, and I, I began to realize here that I'm not going where I thought I was heading with this. And Kathy, the other morning, I probably came across as a little bit confused, and maybe I was when it comes to what I was preaching on today. And I'm thinking, Lord, what's going on here? I've done my research. My notes are there. But I began to write in a different direction, and I didn't do what I had planned to do. Sometimes it works that way. I believe this morning that God took me in a different direction, and I was saying, Lord, this is a simple message this morning as I was preparing yesterday, and, but I felt the Lord leading me there, and I settled there. And yes, throughout the day, I began to wonder about it yesterday, and my wife knew I was a little bit But she knows I'm weird on Saturdays anyway because my mind is here. But I was a little bit, little bit more agitated than was, you know, because I knew what I thought I was going to do. But then I settled it. The Lord knows that somebody this morning, either here or listening, needs to hear this message: that the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus comes that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. So I settled there, and here I am. We'll pick up. The other part may be somewhere down the line. The word life is one of the key words of the gospel message. One of the key words of the gospel message, and this is not going to work for me now. Let's see. It's frozen up. One of the key words of the, okay, here it is. Catch up there, computer. John 3, 16 says this. We sang it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Say it with me if you want. Whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have eternal life. What a beautiful verse of Scripture. 1 John 4 and 9, this is how God showed us his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. Eternal life and then live through him. 1 John 5 and 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Think about that this morning. Whoever has Jesus in their hearts, he has life. Whoever has refused to accept Christ does not have life. You might be physically alive this morning, but without Jesus, you are spiritually dead. You may be breathing, walking, talking, thinking, But without Jesus Christ, there's something inside of you. That most important part of you is dead. Because there's only life found in Jesus Christ. And the scripture that I mentioned a few moments ago, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What Paul is saying here is that the outcome... The reward, if you would, tongue-in-cheek, of sin is death, spiritual death, separation from God, and separation eternally in the hell is the ultimate result of the sin that we are born with and the sin that we live with and the sin that we still continue to commit until we meet Jesus. And he is the gift of God. Jesus Christ, the gift of God, is eternal life and is found in Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. Some of the verses I read refer to life that I'm talking about this morning as eternal life. Now, when we think of that word eternal, we normally, most often, I'm sure, think in terms of lasting forever. Something with an unending existence. Well, I believe this morning that that's certainly a part of the gospel. Those who receive Jesus Christ will live forever. I believe the body is temporal and the body will die. But when God created humanity, 
He breathed into us, and we became a living soul. We were capable of knowing God and a relationship with God, and that's how it worked in the beginning. But sin entered the picture. But Jesus came. Sin destroyed what God intended, but Jesus came. And when we receive Christ, yes, this body which is a, will die, and that is a result of sin. You, will, you might live to be 110, but somewhere along the way, you're going to die. No matter what science does or says. Your body will die, but your soul is eternal. I believe that yesterday we stood here and we had a celebration for a wonderful lady of faith. We took her remains to the cemetery, the tent that she dwelled in for 90-odd years. We took her to the cemetery. We respectfully laid her body in the grave. But one day, there's going to be a resurrection. That body is in that grave, but her soul is in the presence of the Lord. And one day, Jesus is going to come. And I know this is old-fashioned preaching, but we need to stick to the goods this morning. Jesus is going to come. The trumpet is going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to be raised first. And those of us who are going to be a little bit behind, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. And together, we will be with the Lord. And the body and soul reunited. Jesus died so that we might live, and we're going to live with him forever and forever. So eternal life is an unending existence, but it's more than that. Eternal life is, yes, in the future, but it's a present possession. Eternal life is defined by someone as a quality of life and not just duration of life. Quality of life, think about that this morning. Quality of life and not just duration. John 10 and 10. Jesus, as I said, Jesus said, he come, the thief comes to kill and all the stuff I've mentioned. But he said, I'll give you life to the full. The King James says, the thief comes but to steal, to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life. And that's the scripture I grew up on. I like the NIV, and I usually use the NIV, but I cut my teeth on this one, the King James Version, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I love that word here, they might have it more abundantly. The New Living Translation says this, the thief's purpose is to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but Jesus said, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Are you satisfied with your life this morning? Someone said eternal life is not simply life that never ends, but a fullness of life that is unending. Let me keep that there for a moment. Let that sink in. Eternal life is not simply life that never ends, but a fullness of life that is unending with the focus on the fullness of life. Is your life full this morning? Fullness of life, abundant life, eternal life is about knowing and experiencing. And I don't mean to sound shallow this morning, but when I use words like happiness and joy, I'm not talking about just a feeling of glee here. I'm talking about happiness and joy that is deep within our spirit. And even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even when we are by the, uh, on, on a bed of sickness, uh, there's a joy unspeakable and full of glory that Jesus gave us. Uh, the world didn't give it, uh, and the world can never take it away. It is found in Jesus Christ. So the happiness that I talk about here is not a feeling we get based on circumstances. It's a deep sense of joy that only comes from knowing Jesus Christ. A deep sense of satisfaction even when things aren't going the way you think they should or you would like for them to be going. There's something deep within your heart. There's a freedom. There's a confidence that comes. There's a comfort that is found in having a personal relationship with God. When you lay your head on your pillow at night, 
to rest. I trust you rest well. And I believe this morning the only way we can rest well is when we know that we're in a right relationship with God. And when I close my eyes tonight to sleep, I know that if Jesus should come in the middle of the night or if life should leave this body, I know that I would open up my eyes in the presence of the Lord because Jesus died and rose again and somewhere alive Along this journey called life, I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, and all is well with my soul. I trust it is well with yours this morning. Satisfying relationship with God, abundant, overflowing with the life of God. Are you overflowing with the life of God this morning? Full of victory, a sense of assurance. Hope. Folks, the world is not going to give it. You know, we hear it all the time. Someone sat with me this week and said, Pastor, don't you agree that the world is in a mess? You might say, Pastor, we've been saying that ever since we've been on this planet. And people before us said it and before them, people said it. But you have to be honest this morning. Maybe it's because we're more informed now because of uh, multimedia and the, you know, television news and so on. But I don't know. It seems like everything is all messed up, don't you think? But Jesus is coming. And some people today have lost their hope. And they say, Pastor, I thought this government would fix it. I, I thought this group would fix it. I thought this would help. I thought this infusion of money would help. I thought this would happen. Is not going to be fixed until Jesus comes and makes all things right. But in the midst of that, I still have hope. Amen? I have hope in Jesus. That's the life that he promised to give. It is life that is complete. That word complete, I thought about this morning, a silly illustration. I'm not a, I, I don't like pancakes. I can't stand pancakes. Can't stand it. I don't, I don't know why anybody. I don't know if it's a pancake or that sweet syrup that people put on it. I've been out there in the breakfast with the youngsters, and I've seen kids just pour all that on there, and I'm there, oh, my word, that's not fit. You know, I've seen Pastor Andy and others eat that, and I'm thinking, you guys are crazy, you know? Like, who likes that stuff, you know? But we got a box of pancake mix in our cupboard, our pantry. Every now and again, someone comes, and they want pancakes. And I says, Linda, you're on pancake watch. I'm not even going to make it. I like the Totens, though. <laughs> I don't like the maple syrup, but I don't like the pancake syrup. Well, whack the molasses to it. <laughs> Which you might say, that's even worse. But we, got, we had pancake box in our, what does it say? It's for people like me who are dummies at making pancakes. It says, complete. <laughs> All you got to do is add water. And I got a tendency even to mess that up. But it says, complete. Everything you need is in that little mixture. John, you know I was done. You make pancakes all the time. I know you do. And you take that and you put a bit of water in, you throw it on the griddle, you burn it up, and you feed it to somebody, right? But it's complete. Not to be facetious here this morning, but call me weird, but that came in my mind earlier this morning, how that we are complete in God. Everything I need is found in Jesus Christ. I preached it. I believed it. I still believe it. I'm still going to preach it. Wholeness. Is found in Jesus Christ. That's eternal life. That is not only for the there and then, that's for the here and now. I use that phrase a lot, not only there and then. I thank God for the there and then, but we're not there yet. But I'm glad I can have the there and then and the here and now. I can experience the fullness of God right here, right now. In this life we have hope. In this life we have joy. In this life, as I journey through this life, as hard as it may be sometimes, I am complete. I am whole. Am I perfect? No. I'm working out my salvation daily with the help of the Spirit as I surrender to God's plan for my life, as I dedicate to the disciplines of, of walking with Jesus, and as I grow, as I read the Word and pray and spend time in worship, daily I work out my salvation, and I'm not going to be perfect until I'm on the other side. But until then, the Lord is doing a work in me, and He's going to bring it to fruition at His return. 
as long as I submit to him. So he's working on me. And I have eternal life here and now. I trust you do as well. How was it received? Very simple. How was it received? Jesus said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life. Can't get much clearer than that. Whoever believes, but those who reject will not have this life. John eleven twenty five. 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. In other words, even though physically you die, you will live. You will live now and you will live eternally. And to live, the word live there is much more than just physical breathing life. It is life with God. It is the fullness of life. And the key to it is believing. But what does believing mean? What it means to believe. It means to believe what the Bible says about Jesus. It means to give mental assent to some facts. What are they? That he was born of a virgin. He was God in human flesh, the incarnation. He died on the cross as a penalty for our sin, our sacrifice. Believe that. He was raised on the third day for our salvation. These are the capstones of the gospel. These are essential to the gospel. If you don't believe that, then there's there's something wrong. You're missing something. You must believe these important facts about the gospel. It means to rely or to put your faith in those facts. Not only to have mental assent to these facts, but to put your trust in it, to believe in it, to put your faith in these absolutes that are here. But believing is more than that. Believing is to surrender your life to Jesus. Some people say, well, pastor, all I got to do is accept some facts and I believe that believing also means that I commit my life to Jesus Christ. I surrender my life to him. Romans 10 and 9. We know this scripture. Pastor Derek quotes this scripture a lot. And I I appreciate when he gives that appeal. And he'll always use the scripture. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is simple. You see, the gospel, receiving Christ is not complicated. We all know Billy Graham. We've, we've known him. Maybe some of the younger ones may not know, but we've heard him preach. Preach powerful messages of salvation. And he always used to make it so simple, didn't he? Simply believe. Believe. Jesus died, was born, died, rose again. Accept Christ into your life. Surrender your life to Jesus. Declare with your mouth. And when you declare with your mouth, when you confess with your mouth, and that is verbally, and I believe, I believe the importance of doing this, Pastor Derek. I believe that we need to tell someone else that I've just given my life to Jesus. You know, in our tradition here is we we give altar calls and we invite people to come down to the front and many of you have have responded to Christ in that way. Billy Graham was known for these massive altar calls and people come forward for faith and I believe at that point in time as the process unfolds, as you open up your heart to Jesus, you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Let me say this, maybe I'm too simple in my thinking, but if I'm going to confess with my mouth that someone hears me say that Jesus is my Lord, I'm going to live for him. He's going to be Lord of my life. It begins with that verbal declaration. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. That's how it's done. I didn't say anything about joining a church there. I didn't say anything about agreeing to our view of eschatology or the end times. Didn't mention that. The basic essentials of the gospel, Jesus came, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again. That is the gospel. Let's not convolute it this morning. Believe in that. Surrender your life to him. And the Bible says, you shall be saved. I still like that word saved, amen? I still like to know that I've been delivered from my sin. 
The invitation is given by the Spirit of God. In fact, I thought about this as well this week, that in the last book of the Bible, and I believe maybe the last chapter in Revelation 22, verse 17, we have the last invitation given in the Bible concerning this gift of eternal life. And it says, let the one who is thirsty, and we sang about it this morning, let the one who is thirsty, let them come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift, the free gift of salvation, the free gift of the water of life. Are you thirsty this morning? And that word thirsty, that word thirst is a metaphor for a spiritual longing deep within our hearts. And we use the word hunger. And Jesus used different symbols to, or different things to illustrate that. He said, I am the bread of life. If you're hungry, come and feed. I am the water of life. If you're thirsty, come and drink. And some of you this morning, you are thirsty. You're listening today. Maybe someone in this audience, maybe someone listening on, on, on the internet this morning, and you are thirsty, and you're drinking from broken cisterns. You're drinking from contaminated wells. You're drinking from the water that is bitter. You're drinking and feeding from things that's going to destroy. You're like the prodigal son, and you're feeding of the husk around you, and it's filled with dirt and grit and grunt and, and it's gross even to think about it. it's not satisfying it gives you a little fix for a moment it gives you a little bit of euphoria for a few seconds it, 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 that drink the drug whatever it is and it satisfies you for a moment but it always leaves you broken it always leaves you longing for more and you do everything in your power to get that next fix you'll hurt whoever comes in your way You might say, Pastor, you're talking about extreme cases. Not everybody outside of the faith is like that, and that is true. But in all of us, there's something longing for more. You see, the Bible says that God in his faithfulness, when he created us, he put eternity in our hearts. There's a longing for something more in every one of us. There's a desire for something more than what we have in and of ourselves. And people are searching. And the sad reality is some people don't know where to find it. That's why we are responsible to tell them about Jesus. But there's something here that's longing for something more. No, not everybody is off the rails when it comes to drugs. And people might say, Pastor, you know, I'm not there, but so many are. But yet there's people today, and you say, Pastor, I'm carrying on a good life. You know, I'm making a good income. I'm spending it right. I've got a good family. Not everything is in a mess, and I agree with that. But deep down inside, there's something missing. And you're longing for more. Things will not fill it. Large bank accounts will not satisfy it. The accumulation of material wealth will not do it. It It's only found in the water of life. And his name is Jesus. Do you still believe he's the water of life? He is the life today. And when we come to Christ, when we come to Christ, there's a transformation. Maybe I'll pick this up a little in another sermon, but in the scriptures we read, there's a transformation that comes. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. A new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. I don't use the message a lot in preaching. I believe it's certainly good to use along with the translation. It's a paraphrase, but I like it. It says, anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start. Don't you believe that this morning? I like that. Anybody who united with Christ gets a fresh start. It's created new. The old life is gone, and a new life emerges. Whatever the context was of your salvation experience, when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you invited him into your heart, we say. You confessed with your mouth that he is Lord. Something changed in you. You became a new creature. Yes, this sinful nature still rears its ugliness sometimes. And yes, we are tempted and sometimes we mess up. That's what I talked about, working out our salvation. But when you rise from that altar, wherever that altar was, you rise a new woman, a new man in Jesus Christ. I do believe that. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
We used to sing a song. Sometimes we still hear it sung. I'm not the man I used to be. I'm not the woman I used to be. This is what I was. But this is who I am now in Jesus Christ. That's new life. And I guess one of the greatest illustrations, the greatest examples in the Scripture about a life that was changed was Paul. He didn't start out as Paul. His name was Saul. And you read about him in the book of Acts. And I'll just clue up with this, with this story. And you know it. I'm sure you know it well. But Saul was a, a Jewish leader. He was well versed in the Jewish law and the Old Testament scriptures. And he was passionate for the Jewish ways. But this new group came along called the followers of Jesus, the sect. You know, this people of the way. Jesus has died and rose again, gone back to heaven. The Spirit has come, and there's, a, there's now a, a rebirth of the church. And, and followers are just, the group is growing. But as they grow and they become deeper in their ways with Jesus, the persecution is ramped up. And we read about Stephen, this young man, Stephen, and he's preaching the gospel and he gets in trouble for doing it. He, he gets called into the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leadership, and, and he's drilled for what he's doing and he, and he still declares that Jesus is Lord. So they eventually, he doesn't win that battle, eventually he's stoned to death. And the Bible tells us that stood off in the distance, in the shadows, was this, name, this man named Saul. And he was, it was right in his glee to see what was happening. And he was doing it in the name of God. Talk about being misled by religion. And he watched as Stephen was stoned to death. And Stephen, known to be our first martyr, he, he took the rocks. And he said, Lord, I see you standing at the right hand of the Father. He died for what he believed in. Saul stood there at a distance. The Bible says he left that and he, he went and he got permission to travel to Damascus. And his desire, and the Bible says he was murderous in his attitude. He was firm. He was intense. There was a viciousness about him. It was his passion. And his desire was to destroy the church, to destroy these, these believers, these so-called believers. And he had the letters of authority. He had his credentials with him. And with his entourage, he was making his journey to Damascus. Where he was going to just continue his pursuit. And there in the road to Damascus, something happened. He had a revelation, a vision. Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up. The Bible tells us that Saul, and I'm not filling in all the blanks here, but giving you the gist of it this morning. That Saul fell off his horse and he was blinded and, and he was told to go to a certain house and there'll be a prophet there. And God met with this prophet in a vision and said, there's a man here and you're going to have to go pray with him. His name is Saul and has scared the life out of Ananias. Ananias is saying, man, he's the lunatic. He, he, he's the biggest threat to the church. And you're telling me I got to go and pray with him? But Ananias did it. He's a murderer, Lord. He was there when Stephen was killed, and he's out to get people like me. Go and pray with him. And Ananias went and prayed with, Paul, with Saul. Yes, Saul's process of salvation began on the road to Damascus, but it culminated in the house of Ananias when the Bible says his eyes were open. He was blind now, and the scales fell off, and it's like he saw the Lord in a powerful way. And he was filled with the Spirit. He was changed. And what happened? Saul became Paul. Even his name changed. And he went about and he became, outside of Jesus, the greatest missionary or evangelist who ever graced the planet. And today, most of the epistles are credited to the Apostle Paul. And at one place, at one place he said this. He said, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, he said, because I persecuted the church of God. Here he's confessing. This is long after his salvation experience, but even as he was writing this to, to the church in Corinth, he said, I'm the least of the apostles. I persecuted them. But by the grace of God, 
Here it is. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me, I love this, was not without effect. I don't know if that registers with you like it did to me yesterday morning. But his grace to me is not without effect. It makes a difference. The message says, I don't deserve to be included in the inner circle with the apostles. He says, you well know, having spent all those early years trying my best to stamp God's church right out of existence, but because God was gracious, so very generous, here I am. Saul of Tarsus, a murderer, became a missionary because of the amazing grace of God. He was given new life, a new start, a new makeover, a new creature, a new creation by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit because of Jesus' work. He went on to become the greatest leader in the church. His life was changed. And no one writes anymore about life in Christ than Paul does because he experienced it. And this morning... As I wrap this up, the worship team is coming. I encourage you today, you say, Pastor, if you only knew my life, Pastor, I'm the worst of the worst. Maybe you feel that way. I'm the worst of the worst. My life is a mess. Could anybody love me? Jesus loves you. And as I said at the beginning this morning, somebody in this audience, whether it's here or online this morning. When I sat to my table yesterday morning, not going where I've gone this morning, but steered this way as I began to type and thoughts began to come and scriptures began to come. And as my wife came out a little later and said, you're done, I said, I'm gone in a totally different direction and I just got to basically trust the Lord with this. It's because someone need it. I got to hold to that. Someone somewhere listening today or next week needs to hear that there's new life that can be found in Jesus. And if you're in this audience, in this building this morning, in a moment I'm going to invite you to get out of your pew and come down to the front and say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe there's someone here in that situation Or if you're listening by way of the internet this morning, right now, right where you are, pray this prayer, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I believe that you died and rose again for me, and I accept you into my heart, into my life, and I ask you to save me right now. I believe, Lord. My friend, this morning, if you you pray that prayer, you're now a child of God. Amen, church? Amen. We're going to stand and sing this song. We're going to stay online for just another couple moments there, Woody. This song says, all who are thirsty. Would you stand with me now? Can you put the words up there? I'm not sure who's back there. All who are thirsty, all who are weak. Here's the invitation. Come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away. The waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep. And the chorus says, come, Lord Jesus. That invitation to ask Jesus to come. For you that are thirsty, for you that are weak, come to this fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away. The waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep. We're going to sing it. Ryan, if I, or if I could have this microphone, I'll turn off the earpiece. Give me the monitor as well. Let me lead this with Kathy this morning. And this morning, as we sing it, with every eye closed this morning, Father, if there's one here today who needs this life that is found in Jesus, give them the courage to come. Give them the courage to come and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Lord, help them believe. Help their unbelief, Lord. As we sing this song, Lord, give them the courage. 
in Jesus' name. Could we sing it? I still need a bit more monitor right here. Give me something. Let's sing it together. And this altar is open. I still need monitor. I'm not getting it. Let's sing it. Kathy, lead us, will you? Soul. Let it be washed away. 